Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Firstly, I want to share some news with you all. I am a huge fan of The Vampire Diaries. My favourite character is Bonnie Bennett. Kat Graham, who is an amazing actress, plays Bonnie, and I had the chance to speak to her and some other fans last week, and it was amazing. And she's such a lovely person, and it was great to connect with people all around the world. Uh, that's my little brag, I suppose. <laughs> this week's book is The Forever Song by Julie Kagua, the last book of the Blood of Eden trilogy. I was so excited to start reading this. The Immortal Rules and Eternity Cure are both brilliant and end on such cliffhangers, which after reading The Immortal Rules doesn't come as a surprise. This book has a four and a half star rating on Goodreads and took me four days to finish reading. After the end of The Eternity Cure, I'm not entirely sure where the plot is going, so as much as I'm aware of what's happened and I do know the characters, I felt a little as though I was going into this book slightly blind compared to reading The Eternity Cure. This review will contain spoilers about the first two books, so consider yourself warned. Vengeance will be hers. Alison Sekimoto once struggled with the ultimate question. Is she a human or monster? With the death of her love, she has her answer. Monster. Embracing her inner darkness, Ali is now determined to hunt and kill Saren, the psychopath who murdered Zeke. But the trail is bloody and long, and Saren is leading Ali's dangerous fight to the one place she must protect at any cost. Eden. The last safe zone on Earth. Forced into a battle that it may be impossible to win, Ali is about to face her darkest days. And if she succeeds, she could face surviving forever, alone. The thrilling final instalment of the Blood of Eden trilogy. I feel as though you do need to have read the previous two books in order to fully understand the synopsis, and knowing what I do know after reading those books, this synopsis made me so excited to start reading, although a little anxious for the characters too. <laughs> like the previous two books, this is split into three parts, Demon, Lost and Eden. I was so excited to start reading. There is what I suppose you could call a prologue in this novel, and not knowing what's about to happen in these pages, I felt that it pretty much sets the reader up for reading the rest of the book. I felt that this novel picked up almost right from the ending of The Eternity Cure, and so I wasn't quite concerned about a time jump. I felt as though it might have been days at most. In typical Julie Kagawa style, the first page puts the reader in immediate suspense, and I'm already on edge for what might be about to happen. It was strange to think that the circumstances in which this book starts in regards to the people that Ali is with haven't changed for quite a while, since before the ending of The Eternity Cure, but it's only now that I felt I began to see a family dynamic between Ali and the company she's keeping, which in hindsight makes so much sense, but I found it almost entertaining that I hadn't noticed it until now. The mood soon changes. <laughs> Ali becomes so obsessive in regards to not having anything left and giving up that she almost doesn't care what anyone thinks of her anymore because what's the point? And I felt that even at this point in the story, knowing what I do of Ali, this was still a human part of her thoughts. We reach a climax a lot sooner than I expected, and immediately I tried to come up with the various outcomes and how those outcomes would affect the main plot before the scene has even really started. <laughs> For whatever reason, it's also at this point that I feel I might have an idea as to what the title of this book could possibly mean. And shortly after this scene, the family dynamic that I mentioned earlier is pretty much confirmed when the oldest of the vampires refers to them as a coven. Even given the current events, it did warm my heart a little. Wow. I honestly felt a pull in my stomach in response to the scene, and I felt that Kanan was most definitely playing the role of a parent to Ali rather than just her sire. I really want to share with you what Kanan says to Ali, because... wow. But you'll have to read the book. <laughs> as much as I'm still distraught about certain events that have taken place, there's a scene in Chapter 4 where Ali really comes to terms with something that she hadn't been allowing herself to think about, and in that scene I feel as though the reader is also most definitely offered an opportunity for closure. Although I did come to terms with something that had happened, I still felt as though I wouldn't fully accept that it had happened until I'd finished reading the book. 
So I reached chapter five of this book in just over an hour, and the plot shows no signs of slowing down anytime soon, which of course means that I have no intention of putting the book down anytime soon. I am desperate to find out what's going to happen next and what's going to happen ultimately. Oh my goodness, they are like a pair of kids, and Kanan is like the parent who's only just realising what he signed up to, but I still love it. I love the relationships that they have with each other, and as much as they all have their differences, I suppose I love the fact that for the time being, they don't have to be alone. Saren. Wow. This was a situation I'd almost forgotten about as I was so focused on their primary goal, but Julie Kagwa has a clever way of continually reminding the reader of current circumstances and the immediate problem that the protagonists face. So I realised that a certain situation hadn't miraculously resolved itself, and that achieving their current goal would be more complicated than I previously thought. By chapter 6, it seems like the climax of the main plot is looming oh so near, and so I figure that things aren't going to play out how I thought or hoped they would, in order to account for the remaining 200 odd pages that I've yet to read. And throughout literature, there are just some villains you can't help but love. Saren is not one of those villains. Halfway through chapter 6, I realise that I hate him now. To echo Ali's words, he's a disgusting psychopath. This guy literally has no sense of empathy, and this was just one step too far for me. I'm now willing the protagonists so much to achieve their current goal. Towards the end of chapter 6, I just sighed in frustration and actually said, oh my goodness. I can completely understand Ali, and I feel that she's more than justified in how she's feeling, but just slow down. <laughs> this is the last situation I felt that she needed to be going into with an unclear mind. Okay, so I hit page 116 when this hits me. I read a post ages ago that said something about when you've almost finished a book but there's way too many loose endings, but the worst thing being that when you feel you're almost at the end of the plot, but there's like 100 pages left. <laughs> I was really feeling the latter at this point and it worried me a little. The end of chapter 6 and the end of part 1. What on earth just happened? I'm slightly annoyed at this point, I have no clue what's going on. This is another example of Julie Kagawa leading the reader to believe that something in particular is going to happen before presenting them with a situation they'd never have thought of. Throughout the past couple of chapters, I'd gasped, clapped my hand over my mouth and said, oh my goodness, I don't know how many times. But starting chapter 7, which marked the start of part 2, at half past 10, seemed like my only option. The end of chapter 9. Wow. Possibly the biggest breath of relief I'd taken since I started reading this book. It was also then I realised that I was almost halfway through the book, and that I'd read just short of 200 pages in just under three hours. Oops. Wow. Chapter 12. I've mentioned before how brilliantly written Judy Kagwa's fight scenes are. Previously throughout the series, most fight scenes have been between Ali and one or two opponents, or Ali and a friend against two or three. My point being that apart from when it's been appropriate in regards to who Ali is with, Ali is usually fought alongside one or two people, and I'm usually certain of the outcome before I get there. However, in this scene, I feel it's written on a slightly larger scale. Ali is accompanied by a few others and is facing a group of rabbits. As per usual, the ratio of action to description I felt worked perfectly, and once again the dialogue is used effectively to maintain the flow of action. Oh my goodness, I can't get over the villain in this novel, because he's vile. Some villains have redeemable traits, some tragic backstory, or something that makes them seem relatively human and understandable. The villain in this novel has none of those things. At this point, I actually think he's vile, and he is absolutely insane. And I need to know what's going to happen to him. Ali and Zeke's continuous yet spontaneous declarations of love for each other throughout this just give me so much hope, in general. I know that they're fictional, oh my goodness, but the way that they're written. They pick each other up all the time, they believe in compromise, they know that they can't be 100% all of the time, sometimes Zeke is going to be in a really bad place for whatever reason, and during those times Ali has to give 80% instead of 50 you know? They've seen each other at their best and their worst and at this point, and have decided that they still want to be with each other. Again, usually when a relationship is written like this, I usually feel that because it's been written for the sole purpose of making for good reading, 
it's ridiculously unrealistic. But everything that Ali and Zeke have been through together and seen each other through, I feel, completely justifies how they've managed to reach this current stage in their relationship. I love you, and I won't let you fall. In the same paragraph, I could have cried. But it seems like every time these books have made me want to cry, I've never been in a situation where I felt comfortable enough to do so. The end of chapter 13. I guess it really is an unlucky number. The climax of this book and the ending seemed so near, and yet, when a final checkpoint is reached, everything seems to come tumbling down. Again, I don't know why I let myself have hope, but starting chapter 14 at quarter to ten, I had to carry on reading. At the end of chapter 14, I do appreciate how realistic these books are, in terms of things not working out perfectly all of the time, but I also kind of want everyone to catch a break. Every time something is achieved, it seems like a case of one step forward, two steps back. At quarter past ten, I was fairly sure I could finish this book that night, but I decided to save the last part of the book, Eden, to read the next day. Oh my goodness, the end of chapter 15 and the end of part two. It was written perfectly, and due to everything that you read from the beginning of The Immortal Rules up until that point, the raw emotion in that scene is perfectly clear to the reader, and I loved it. I mean, I felt that it was a scene that had been coming for a long time, but I'm so glad that it took the time that it did before it happened, because I think that was just beautiful. I finished reading at half past ten and decided I would finish this book the next day. So I started the last part of the book, Eden, the next day, and part way through chapter 16, I can just about take this tension. I'm somehow relatively optimistic about the events I believe are about to play out, but I'm also aware that I don't actually know what might be about to happen. At the end of chapter 16, I felt as though the ending was just being dragged out now, due to how close I felt the ending was. However, the tension only ever seemed to increase, which towards the end of the novel, I constantly didn't think was possible. <laughs> Then I saw the first line of chapter 17, and my jaw dropped. Neither Ali or the reader has much time to process or come to terms with things in this book, but at the same time, part of me also loved that. Nearing the end of chapter 18, I felt physically sick at the thought of what I felt was being hinted at. After everything, if this happens, I'll be fuming. I'll be so upset. It can't end like this, it just can't. Wow. Thanks, Julie Kagawa. Thanks so much. You know what? I didn't even cry. Obviously, I was upset, but I mostly just felt empty, and part of me genuinely thought, what's the point of even finishing the book now? You know, because I've never been there before. <laughs> but I continued reading simply because I'm the type of reader who doesn't give up on a book. But I felt as though I had next to no investment in the book or the plot at this point. Halfway through chapter 19... What on earth? I'm pretty livid at this point. No one gets to catch a break. And this character, I was basically reading now because I'd almost finished the book, and so I may as well actually finish the book. But I'd given up hope of anything, really. <laughs> wow. The ending. I suppose in more ways than one, it was a happy ending, but it came at quite a significant cost, and I felt pretty empty after reading this. As a reader, you go through a stage of feeling rather strange after finishing a book you've been completely invested in, and finishing this trilogy just reminded me how much I'm able to love books, as empty as I felt. Obviously, if you like vampire fiction, you have to read these. The romance is brilliant, and teen fiction fans, I feel as though these books could most definitely be your gateway into young adult fiction. Julie Kagawa, thank you so much for the emotional roller coaster, the tears, laughs, and sleepless nights. Like and subscribe, guys, and join me next time for my review of Hamilton. Stay safe and happy reading!